Okay, welcome to Taiwan Talk. I'm Trevor Tordomasi, and this week I'm speaking with Dr. Matan Shalomi, professor of entomology at National Taiwan University. So, Matan, entomology is the study of insects, or so I have read, but I'm told it extends to other bugs as well. Can you tell me a little bit more about entomology? Sure. Uh, well, entomology is one of the few like studies of animals that still has its own department. You don't really hear of ornithology or herpetology getting their own. Do you not? Not as much as oh, okay. entomology. Uh, mostly because, well, well, we'll talk more about insects, but just they are the dominant animal life form on the planet, so probably merits their own uh, field of study. Within entomology, you'll have people study spiders, millipedes, centipedes, not quite enough to that they'll get their own department, and we welcome them into entomology. We don't uh, discriminate against the other arthropods. Uh, nematodes will sometimes be lumped into entomology. Little roundworms, they're actually somewhat related to the to the arthropods, to the spiders and insects. Uh, and they also have a lot of uh, agriculture uses. And that's the main purpose of entomology. Well, sorry, not the main purpose, but one of the main reasons people study it is for agriculture. Uh, insects eat about one third of all the crops that we grow, uh, either in the field or after the harvest, in the, if it's in, in storage or in the stores, somehow they get to all of it. So we're trying to bring that number down. And so a lot of entomology is pest management. It's not my field. I'm not in pest management, but that is a major part of entomology. And one reason why uh, there's the joke, an entomologist is a biologist with a job. <laughs> so I've only been doing a few projects here, and I like doing multiple projects at a time. Just that's my the way the way I operate. Uh, still, I think the most interesting thing I've done so far was my college, uh, sorry, my grad school dissertation uh, on the stick insect physiology. So stick insects uh, are in Chinese like bamboo walking stick. They look like sticks with legs. There was one of them in the movie A Bug's Life. People might remember that one. <laughs> uh, so I was studying their digestive system. Um, for the main reason that we had a lot of them in the lab where I worked, so it was convenient. I didn't have to go collect anything or buy anything or raise anything. Oh, we're already raising them. Uh, and no one else had studied them. So I thought, okay, it's a open field. Anything I discover will be new. And surprise, surprise, they are actually really unique. Their digestive system is completely unlike that of any other insect. Uh, physiology is different. They have their own organ that other insects don't have, and we're still trying to figure out what it does. Um, and they have all these digestive enzymes that insects aren't supposed to have. Actually, a gene jumped from bacteria into the stick insects and gave them this whole new set of genes. It ended up just being, I got lucky. I picked a system that was really unique and got, you know, sort of made a name for myself. And I think the handful of stick insect experts in the world all know my name at this point, and, but we all know each other. It's a small <laughs> field. How, how many entomologists would there be in Taiwan, ranging from 10 to 10,000? Uh -huh. We're looking at a number in the, um, probably at least 100. Well, uh, actually this week, um, well, maybe not this week. Uh, sorry, so there's the Taiwan Entomological Society uh, meeting that's going to be on the weekend of October 17 and 18. Uh, I can count and see how many people are there, but I'm guessing about 200 uh, people will come to this, and that includes the uh, professors and the grad students and undergrads who are interested. You know, how many entomologists are there? Are we asking how many are working for academia, how many are working for private industry, and how many are just, you know, beetle enthusiasts that really like this? <laughs> A lot of entomology research is done by hobbyists. They're doing it for fun. Uh, I mentioned, you know, the stick insects. Uh, the number one stick insect expert of Singapore, a Singaporean guy, he knows all the stick insects of Singapore and Malaysia and that region. Uh, by day, he's a gynecologist. So his day job is gynecology, and his passion is entomology. But, you know, he is the expert of the stick insects of Singapore. Like, he, he knows all of it. And, like, and that's very valuable knowledge, this um, knowledge of the organisms that live in a certain area. It's very specialized knowledge, and, you know, it's a pity when these, you know, these experts die if they don't pass on their knowledge to someone else. Um, do people bring bugs to share? Is it, is it a pretty cool thing to have pets or is that more just to leave them at work where they're safe? Oh, no, or? there's a big trade in, um, you know, you go to entomology, and there is the, uh, I always go to, I try to go to the American Entomology, the Entomological Society of America meetings every year. Obviously, this year it's a bit uh, complicated. And right. there's every four years the International Congress of Entomology. It was supposed to be this year. Uh, it got pushed back for obvious reasons. And those are always fun, lots of experts. And you do occasionally, well, sorry, there's always um, a booth by BioQuip. It's a big company that sells entomology-related tools and equipment, and there's always going to be a booth of people selling pinned specimens of insects and occasionally live things, uh, tarantulas, scorpions, uh, things that can be legally bought and sold 
Um, things like herbivores are usually restricted, at least in the U.S., but tarantulas, no one really cares because they are predators. They're not a pest. They're fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so you see all these people trading things. You see people, you know, all these uh, funny-themed insect pun t-shirts are available. Huh. Um, but also, of course, it's a convention, and there's a lot of business in entomology. You have all the pest management um Every aspect of pest management is going to be there. You know, medical entomology is big. Universities are advertising. So the conventions are pretty big, and they're very fun. And I just like it because it's a chance for me to meet all my friends from uh, from back home. I feel like this is as close as it gets to Pokemon in real life. Oh, more than that. <laughs> uh, so po the guy who invented Pokemon, once again, amateur entomologist. Uh, by day, he was a, a you know game designer, and he actually worked with Nintendo making the uh, the Link Cable that connected the Game Boys. Whoa. So this was his invention. And he had a, um, a dream or a vision or an idea. He imagined ants crawling from one Game Boy to another. Now, he wasn't really an academic entomologist, but he loved collecting beetles. And this is a, a thing very common in Japan and in Taiwan as well. A lot of uh, young people will go collect beetles in the forest and trade them with friends. And beetles can actually fight too. So you have beetle fighting. Again, very much Pokemon. And <laughs> So this, uh, this is Satoshi Tajiri, if I'm not mistaken, the inventor of Pokemon. He, he writes, and he's given interviews, and he said, you know, as he got older in Japan, urbanized, the forests where he used to collect insects have become urban areas, and the insects aren't there anymore. So there's fewer places for people to pursue his hobby, to go and collect things in nature and explore the animals and trade them. So he created a game that's basically... An entomology simulator you can you, these small kids uh, with absolutely no supervision going out into the tall grass and collecting uh, these extremely dangerous creatures but trading them with friends and then you know the game you has a trading mechanic so you can actually trade with friends and now with Pokemon Go people are actually going outside and collecting and trading and battling it's it's very much entomology the game and it's not a surprise that a lot of entomologists like Pokemon <laughs> <laughs> that makes that makes me so happy. Can you describe what you do in a little more detail? Sure. So I'm an uh, assistant professor at National Taiwan University in the Department of Entomology. I do teach courses, and I also have my own laboratory. It's the Insect Microbiology Laboratory. I do research there. I mentor grad students. Um, so the usual professor things. What is a what does a normal day look like for you? Um, depends on whether I'm teaching or not. Uh, I can sometimes show up to work pretty late, but I also stay in the lab very late. Uh, what I love about academia is a lot of flexibility in hours. It's not a nine to five job. Um, you do end up working overtime and weekends not getting paid for it, but it's a labor of love. Uh, so if I teach, I teach. If not, I'm in the laboratory. Um, there's research to be done. There's insects to feed, uh, equipment to buy and paperwork and a lot of paperwork surprisingly and homework to grade so i'm sitting in front of my computer most of the time but every now and then i get to do something fun um we had some field work that we did in the summer so that was exciting uh, conferences are always fun so really every day depends but it's very flexible and it's really up to me what i do every day which is something i really enjoy is this field work seasonal yeah the so our field work was seasonal um the current project I'm working on involves the rhinoceros beetle, the coconut rhino beetle that lives in the south, in southern Taiwan. Best season to get them is during the summer when they're reproducing. We have a lot of larvae. So we went down. We needed them for the new project. So uh, we went down to Kaohsiung, Pingtung, and collected a whole bunch. Uh, one of my students is a beetle expert and knows where to go and has contacts down south who know where to go. So there's a huge beetle collecting network in Taiwan. It's Really convenient. How many students are, are currently uh, are working under you? At this point in time, I have three master's students, and there's undergrads. Um, I try to have an undergrad or two working my lab as well if we, uh, if we need them. Does the environment here in Taiwan, whether it be the professional environment or the literal nature environment, provide you with any uh, access to something that you wouldn't have elsewhere? The world is big, uh, and insects are everywhere. Everywhere you go, you're going to find creatures. You know, you, you study whatever is available to you. What's been fortunate for me in Taiwan is that the government does spend a lot of money on science, but there is a small pool, relatively small pool of scientists who get it, or sorry, who are who are fighting for it. You know, if you're applying for a grant from the National Science Foundation in the U.S., you, it's a lot of professors all fighting for the same pool of money that is shrinking every year. Here, it is just for the fewer academics. I think they have at least 20, maybe 40% acceptance rates for uh, grants from the Ministry of Science. And that goes up if you're you know, a younger researcher. So I was really, really, really very fortunate. 
Uh, and so far, I've gotten not everything I've applied for, but I've been funded for every year that I've been here. So that certainly makes me very happy because I know struggling for grant money is a big portion of the professor's life. And once you have like a multi-year grant, you can relax, um, at least on that front, and focus more on the research, which is much appreciated. Thank you so much, Taiwan. What have been some of your successes in, in studying the f in, in this field? Uh, well, like I mentioned, there's the... The stick insect research that was a big success, you know, find, figuring out new things. There's still those mystery organs that I have some idea of what they do, but uh, it's now beyond my knowledge to prove my hypotheses. So hopefully someone else can try to prove it and uh, look into that. What else? Uh, I'm pretty sure my lab has discovered a new species of bacteria inside a millipede. Oddly enough, while we were collecting um, the rhino beetles, there were lots of millipedes, and I thought, okay, I'm going to take some of these, dissect them when we get to the lab, and see what bacteria live inside them. Lo and behold, we found one that we are pretty sure is brand new. Uh, so I'm now in the process of proving this, um, but that'll be fun. I've, I haven't discovered a new bacteria yet. Do you get to name it? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> what has been, in, in your research, your most unfortunate learning experience? Unfortunate learning? I wouldn't say unfortunate, but you know, the thing, especially when you're dealing with, when you're dealing with science, you're dealing with things that people don't know. So you may have a hypothesis right. that turns out wrong. Uh, but the other thing, also in biology, is you're dealing with nature, and nature does not behave. You know, you want to do field work, and it's raining too bad. You know, if the you need these animals to, you know, survive until next week for the experiment, and then they all die. Too bad. Uh, we had one. I don't know what happened, but at some point, ants got into the mosquito cage in the lab and ate all of them. Oh I don't know how ants eat mosquitoes, but they caught them and yeah, ate they all gotta, of them. They got to catch them. Yeah. Uh, well, the mosquitoes rest. Uh, they aren't, can't I constantly bet. fly. And the ants got <laughs> all we had left in the cage was legs and wings, and we don't understand. Uh, but it was we we have since put ant-proof material around the cage. But uh, so little things like that can be annoying. If you're going to be a scientist, you have to be flexible um, with speed. Right now, I'm waiting on equipment from the US, the UK specialized equipment, and I'd love to do some work, but I have to wait. So I wouldn't say it's an unfortunate learning experience. It's just part of the uh, the business. You know, you're dealing with nature and nature does its own thing. You know, you want the animals to behave in a certain way, or you want to find them when you go out into the forest, you want to find these creatures that you study. Well, it's up to them if, they, if you find them or not. When you were studying mosquitoes, what exactly were you studying? Ah, so uh, that's what I came to Taiwan to do. I got a three-year grant from the Ministry of Science and Technology, the wonderful uh, most, uh, to study the microbes that live in the water where mosquitoes lay their eggs. So mosquitoes lay eggs in water, and any little container will do um, an abandoned cup of bubble tea that got filled with rainwater. In a couple of days, it'll be filled with mosquito larvae. You leave it outside, it gets filled with rainwater, that's a mosquito home. doesn't matter how small it is. Uh, so I was going to study the microbes that live in these and see how they affect mosquitoes. Maybe mosquitoes only come to containers with certain microbes. Maybe they are you know, repelled or attracted by them. Uh, turns out the microbiomes of these containers are one, very small, and two, either there's a microbe that they all have or there's microbes that are unique to one cup. And it was impossible to get any really usable data from there. I ended up publishing like at least two papers on it, but it was null hypothesis, meaning we found out that there was no correlation, which mm. is, it's it's a scientific fact, you know, you gotta publish that, but it's it's frustrating. It would have been much nicer to find something right. useful. It's not a failure though, it is a, is just another learning experience. Right, you know, this is this is how science works. You don't always prove your hypothesis, but as long as you tested it and your methods are valid, it's publishable work. So we were just trying to see what microbes are in the containers where mosquitoes lay eggs and whether this affects um, the mosquito. Now, other scientists oh, are okay. working on this field, and we know that there are some microbes that attract mosquitoes to lay mm -hmm. eggs. You know, some will stimulate the eggs to hatch. Uh, you know, the mosquito larvae, they eat bacteria too, so there might be some that they like more than others. And certainly there are, mis there are bacteria that can affect whether the mosquito vector is dengue well or not, but there is so many different bacteria out there have you dealt with dengue and mosquitoes as well? Well, anyone in southern Taiwan is going to deal with it. Uh, when we went down to southern Taiwan to collect, this was the heart of dengue season. So long sleeves and mosquito repellent uh, as much as possible. Now, Taiwan, by the way, is doing an excellent job with um, mosquito disease control. Um, while we were there, who I was with, I was collaborating with the, the CDC down there. And every two weeks, they do checks in uh, this is Kaohsiung Pingtung, they go to people's property and they look for containers of water. And if there are mosquito larvae in there, you have to pay a fine. 
So that's a really good system. So the government has you know this strong motivation for people to check for containers and empty them. And this could be you know anything like a flower pot that fills up with water or a rain barrel that didn't have a lid on it. Uh, but if there's a container with um, with mosquitoes, that's a problem. And people in Taiwan do a really good job of this vector control on their own property. Just any container you see, dump it out, empty it, and that's probably the best way to control. Um, to control dengue. Um, but of course, it depends on the people being there. And this has to be constant because mosquitoes reproduce very, very quickly. And there was the... Um, so the dengue will always be there. It's just how you control the mosquitoes that are transferring it. Well, dengue could be eradicated. Uh, Taiwan used to have malaria. That used to be a problem in Taiwan. It was eradicated. Malaria is gone. I think we still actually have malaria mosquitoes in Taiwan, but the pathogen is... Sorry, yeah, the malaria pathogen is gone, and as long as nobody's sick with malaria comes to Taiwan, malaria will never be here again. So eradication is possible. Hmm. We've eradicated uh, malaria, and we're hoping to eradicate dengue at some point, but dengue is a bit harder because we don't currently have a good vaccine for it. We have prophylactics for malaria. With dengue, we don't have that yet, so the best way to control dengue is to control the mosquitoes. No mosquitoes, no dengue. What would happen if mosquitoes were suddenly completely removed from the environment? The million dollar question, because people are definitely working on this, and it's really exciting uh, research right now. There's thousands of species of mosquitoes, and we don't need to eradicate all of them. The majority of mosquitoes don't bother us. They don't bite humans at all. You got bird specialists and reptile specialists. You got some that only bite frogs, for example. Um, of the like 100 or so that bite humans... Mm, a fraction of them actually can vector diseases. And really only, there's a handful of species that are the real serious vectors of disease. For malaria, that's Anopheles gambii. That's one species complex. If we got rid of that, almost all malaria would be gone. And for dengue, the big vector would be uh, Aedes aegypti, a little bit also Aedes albopictus, but Aedes aegypti is the big one. Now in Taiwan, Aedes aegypti is found in the south, anywhere south of the Tropic of Cancer that cuts right through Taiwan. So south of Chiai, you're going to have Aedes aegypti. North, it's too cold. Aedes aegypti doesn't survive the winter in northern Taiwan, so we don't have dengue in northern Taiwan. But northern Taiwan is subtropical while the south is tropical, so it's, it's an important difference. Mm. Uh, but again, there are mosquitoes in the north, and people get bitten by them all the time, but these are not the mosquitoes that can vector dengue. So we don't have to kill all the mosquitoes. We just have to kill, you know, for dengue, just kill Aedes aegypti, and already you have saved millions of lives. Now, let's say... That's for know, the impact on the environment? or Yeah, so snap your fingers and all of Aedes aegypti are dead. Well, you've still got Aedes albopictus, Aedes armigera. There's all these other mosquitoes that are still in the same area, and they're going to fill the same niche. They lay their eggs in the same place. They're just as edible to other organisms. The food web won't notice that Aedes aegypti is gone. And we people have you know looked into this because it's no longer hypothetical. You know, humans have obviously brought a lot of organisms to extinction, but we now have the means to eradicate single species without harming others through the you've heard of the CRISPR, for example. We have well I'll tell you the exact technology is we have mutant mosquitoes where the male passes on a gene to ensure that or the male is mutated in such a way that all of his offspring are also male which means every generation, less and less females, more and more men, till eventually you'll have a generation that's all men, and that is the last generation. Mm. And an added bonus is that male mosquitoes don't bite. Only the females bite you because they need the blood, they need the protein in your blood to lay eggs. So you can you know, flood the world with these mutant male mosquitoes, and they're never going to bite anyone because the males don't do that. And because this is you know, sexually transmitted, the males aren't going to mate with any other mosquito, there's no chance of something else being harmed. It's not like you're flooding an environment with pesticides that will kill everything. This is a very targeted you know, method of eradicating the species that is spread by the species itself. We call this autocide, um, self-extermination. We have this technology, and they're rolling it out, and they're testing it in different parts of the world. They're, the experiments are getting bigger. They start with little islands. Now they're moving to, I think larger counties or states in the U.S., it's not hypothetical anymore. We have the means to eradicate Aedes aegypti from larger, larger areas and eventually, in hopefully, planet Earth. I'm sure a lot of this depends on funding and sort of logistics. But oh, absolutely. Uh, what kind of a time scale are we looking at? Like 20 years or 100 years? or I couldn't begin to tell you, oh, but okay. we're looking at it's years and decades for, uh, for sure, and it's not going to be perfect. I mean, look, mm. we still haven't eradicated polio, and we have the means to eradicate that easily. Nature doesn't behave. No, nature and politics and money, uh, <laughs> you know. You know, there are plenty of people in opposition to anything involving genetic modification, and 
they're going to be um, holding it back. But also, you have to be diligent with something like insect eradication because we're going to have to constantly release more and more of these male mosquitoes just to be absolutely sure. If one you know healthy female escapes and reproduces with a healthy male, they're going to have children, and their children have children, and we're back at square one. So these kind of things, you always have to work on it. But it can work. And again, Aedes aegypti always lives in areas with other mosquitoes. It's There's a, a lot of mosquitoes out there. So we're not going to really risk anything. Um, it, the food webs aren't going to collapse anywhere. The ecosystem won't collapse anywhere. The few mosquitoes that are important that would take some other organism with them, I think there's... Um, in the Arctic, there's the mosquitoes are like the only insect that lives in the tundra and the frozen t- when, it, when it thaws. They're the only thing that lives there. So if those mosquitoes go away, it might be bad for some birds that live there. But those are mosquitoes that don't spread disease, so nobody's going to bother getting rid of them. Aedes aegypti and Ophelia scambii, we could get rid of these and nature will not notice. And we would save millions of lives. We would get rid of you know millions of years of morbidity, mortality. It's such a good thing. Uh, we just have to prove that it works and make sure it's cost effective. I have written on my paper here the word insect apocalypse, <laughs> uh, which seems like it could be grammatically ambiguous. Uh, is it the insects taking over or is it an apocalypse for them? What is the insect apocalypse? The insect apocalypse is unfortunately an apocalypse for the insects. We have been detecting severe losses of insects, uh, insect biomass around the world uh, to the tune of someone reported 9% of insect you know, individuals are dying every decade it depends on which insects you're looking at in what country um so these losses are mostly terrestrial insects the aquatic insects are doing fine so dragonflies they're doing actually they're doing better dragonflies are great water striders are great mosquitoes great um so again win and loss for humanity when the aquatic insects are going up but terrestrial insects butterflies bees beetles grasshoppers a major chunk uh we are seeing massive losses in their diversity um, so, you know, some media has called it the insect apocalypse. Now, will that be the end of all insects? Absolutely not. Um, there are some insects that are absolutely thriving. Uh, cockroaches, for example, are in no danger of going extinct anytime soon. But still, you know, this is a very severe loss, and it's just not a good sign. Uh, the insects going away is a sign that we have greatly disturbed um, the planet, but that's kind of obvious. Every time you cut down a forest and build a city, you've created a very major disturbance what's people are looking at with the insect apocalypse you know what what can we do about it and there's no silver bullet there's no one thing we have to do or certainly no one thing we have to stop doing you know if everyone stopped using pesticides tomorrow that's not going to make a big impact when you replace a forest with a city and that city is full of lights that attract the insects and all these cars and people that kill the bugs when they see them you basically created um, a massive trap and we have, you, you have your little forests, but the forests are shrinking and they are surrounded by essentially death. A forest surrounded, whether it's surrounded by a city or surrounded by agriculture with all the pesticides, whatever kind of pesticides are sprayed there, it's going to kill everything. So the forests are now surrounded by death and the insects are leaving the forest because, you know, they don't know what it is. They're exploring. And certainly they like the, the pretty lights. Uh, they leave and they die and they don't come back. So we are just seeing major losses in insect biomass and insect diversity all over the world. And I don't think there isn't, there's anything we can do about it. It's just a side effect of humanity spreading across the world. What impact is this going to have on humanity and on the ecosystem? I think we are going to see some other animals and plants for sure being taken out along with these insects. We are going to see a major loss in diversity. Humanity will go on, life will go on, nature will go on. It just won't be as pretty and diverse as it was before. So a lot of those pretty butterflies might go away, will be replaced with some others, but we'll always have plenty of cockroaches and flies. I was about to ask, does pretty include the cockroaches? or? Oh, there are some very beautiful cockroaches out there. And if you go into the forest in Taiwan, you might see them. There's blue ones and yellow ones and ones that are all black and some with spots and stripes. There are some absolutely gorgeous cockroaches. I can't say I've ever seen a blue cockroach. Wow. You have to look for them. There's a lot of (laughs) Google images I'm going to... Oh, yeah. You type in... Have nightmares from (laughs) it. Now you type beautiful cockroach into Google image and you'll see pictures of these. And they are lovely. They're absolutely beautiful. Wow. Um, what uh, about butterflies? Uh, someone told me, and this is all hearsay, but that Taiwan is like a butterfly paradise. Uh, is it compared to other places? Are there a lot of b- more butterfly species here? 
than you would normally see in other places? Or no, I'm not a butterfly expert, and butterfly experts, you know them when you see them. Um, I have also heard that that Taiwan has really high diversity of butterflies, as in probably a lot of butterflies that are only found in Taiwan wouldn't surprise me. So I think Taiwan is probably a really great place for butterfly lovers to come. What I do know about butterflies in Taiwan uh, that Taiwan has really special is the migrating butterflies. There are only two parts and places in the world where butterflies migrate. They go south for the winter. One of these is North America, the very famous monarch butterflies that migrate in huge swarms from the U.S. down to this one forest in Mexico where they just cover the trees completely. Every surface is covered with beautiful monarch butterflies. And the only other place in the world where insects migrate is Taiwan. The purple crow butterflies, it's a few species of these iridescent purple butterflies. And they all fly to uh, Maolin, which I want to say is in Kaohsiung uh, province, and they go there for, uh, for the winter. Uh, and you can go and, and see the um, the butterflies, and you just you see these butterflies flying around, all these purple butterflies all gathering there. It's, it's a very lovely uh, thing to see, especially when you know the only place in the world we can see this is in t- Taiwan. Yeah, wow. And and uh, coming from California, I, I have been used to to hearing about the monarch migration a lot, and and being in Taiwan, I also heard about that migration. So I kind of assumed it was something that happened all over the world, but no, it's well, just those <laughs> the th- two that's places. It. Those are the only those are the only butterfly wow. migrations in the world. Yeah. So <laughs> about the bees, um, is I, I've heard that the presence of bees is sort of one of many markers, uh, a sort of canary in the coal mine for environmental health. Um, what what truth is is there to that? That's new to me, actually. Okay. Uh, I would put some other things as canary in the coal mines. Um, stone flies that live in the water. Uh, 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 there are other little things that I'd say are more important, especially because the bees, or honeybee at least, it's not even native here. Uh, well, there's the honeybee that's vanishing is the European honeybee, Apis mellifera. And it's vanishing in the U.S. I think there are some problems in Australia. I'm not sure. That hasn't been a problem here. We have different species, the um, Asian honeybee, Apis serrana, different species that's not collapsing there. They're immune to whatever's causing that. Uh, so the honeybee is usually a domestic. It's a domesticated insect. I mean, the same way you would domesticate a horse or almost a dog, only I think dogs are much more well-behaved. So it's people have brought the honeybee with them. And if the honeybee goes, you know, in the U.S., for example, if the honeybee goes extinct, well, the honeybee wasn't supposed to be there anyway. It's not native to America at all. There are other American bees. Now, that being said, there are um, what we call native bees, that are not domesticated. So forget Apis mellifera. There's so many other bees out there. Some of them are also pollinators, some of them very important ones. Um, in the U.S., California, for example, there's the alfalfa leafcutter bee. And it's, a, it's not domesticated. It's a wild bee, but it's very important for pollinating alfalfa, which is the main feed for cows. Then all these you know, wild bees, native bees, they're not doing very well either. And that's just this general uh, loss of insect diversity, insect biomass. They're you know, they're casualties along with everything else. So we are seeing across the board losses in terrestrial insects, and that's including the bees. And these are nice bees, and it's a, a shame to lose them. So we all remember recently uh, when we were worried about the coronavirus, and then something else popped up, and the people started saying you should worry about this more, and it was the murder hornets. Right. Um, and I remember seeing an article on the murder hornet and thinking that seems sort of troubling and then that same day i went out and i was taking a walk down the street and i saw a murder hornet on the on the road you would that is vespa mandarinia the uh giant asian hornet or japanese hornet it's native to japan and taiwan they have always been here so they are fine here um someone in japan coined the term murder hornet recently in the 2000s i don't know why um and a murder hornet I don't, I, don't, I don't even like that term, murder hornet. <sighs> I'm not sure I like it either, Matan. What can we do about this? We'll call it the you know giant Asian hornet, uh, or call it Vespa mandarinia. All right, so giant Asian hornet um, <laughs> was found in Washington State in the, and, and right across the Canadian border, so barely inside America. One of them was found. Now, admittedly, what the Vespa mandarinia does is they eat honeybees. They love eating honeybees. And they're very good at killing honeybees in very large numbers. So, okay, they murder honeybees pretty well. And yes, they do sting. And yes, people can end up in a hospital or dead if they get stung. I think um, if you get 30 Vesper mandarinia stings, you need to go to the ER now. Um, and if you get 60 stings, you may need to go to a church. Uh, but uh, 
so it is dangerous but again people die from honeybees too and honeybee you know it's a similar kind of venom uh just you know it's a big wasp it stings you with a lot more but enough about um it biting people you had this one that got loose in washington and okay people are concerned the honeybee keepers are concerned but after that it's all over the u.s people are like killing anything that they think is a hornet and there's all these you know native american hornets and native american wasps and things that may look like a hornet you know the average person doesn't know what vesper mandarinia looks like they can't pronounce it and so they're just killing whatever they see that's big and colorful and it's ah so unfortunate the memes were fantastic though <laughs> we- oh the memes <laughs> I have so I have so many uh, interesting bug learning adventures after I after I'm looking at this interview <laughs> later. Okay, so we can scratch off Vespa mandarinia from the uh, things to be afraid of list. What bugs should we be afraid of? The main thing to be afraid of is mosquito Aedes aegypti. We are looking. You know, mosquitoes are the deadliest animal to humanity, and that includes other humans. Malaria, dengue, these diseases have killed more people than war all war combined that and historically they have been the number one killer of humanity now we have really good anti-malarials but still malaria is not as you know it's not insignificant it still kills a lot of people in uh, africa and latin america every day and there are a lot of other insects that spread diseases too now if a mosquito bites you don't you know assume you're going to die um you can't tell from the bite if it was infectious or not. Nothing you can do about that. You just have to know, okay, am I in southern Taiwan during dengue season? Oops, I should have used uh, bug spray more effectively. Nothing really you can do um, once you're bitten. But certainly that means people are investing money and research into finding ways to get rid of mosquitoes. And that's actually a big reason why I came to Taiwan in the first place. You know, the stick insect research that I did was fun and exciting and I liked it. But the stick insects don't do anything. They're not even pests. Um, but it worked out. I mean, you know, I did do some research on mosquitoes, and we're still raising mosquitoes in the lab now. Right now, I'm working on uh, some fungi that can kill mosquito larvae. So I'm testing that in the laboratory to see if maybe we have a new weapon we can use against mosquitoes. But the point is, because mosquitoes are such a deadly insect, there's a lot of interest and a lot of money into research on mosquitoes to find some way to get rid of them. And I wanted a piece of that pie. So let's say you have a person who's who's afraid of bugs. Let's say this person is sitting across from you. What would you do to convince someone to not be so afraid of bugs? Best way to get over a phobia is with exposure therapy. And if I know someone is afraid of insects, I am going to do everything in my power to make them hold one. <laughs> okay. What kind is your uh, your go-to? A big beetle, tarantula? Depends where we are. Um, it's kind of hard to hold a mosquito. There's, right. And some are more fun than others, I, I suspect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I'm hiking with people, I'm, I keep an eye out for critters just because... You know, I, I, you develop that eye. You, you start to see them. And, and you know, once you really look carefully, they are everywhere. The insects are everywhere. And if you go out into the forest, you know, one tree or bush can have a bunch of different species on it. Uh, but if I see something big and cool, I'm going to pick it up because I want to hold it. Uh, and if there's anyone with me, I'm going to offer them the opportunity to hold it. Uh, and those who are brave enough to hold it will realize, oh, I didn't explode. Obviously, I'm not going to make them hold something dangerous, but there really aren't that many dangerous things out there. And, you know, a lot of insects, people ask me, like, oh, will it bite? Well, like, well, if you put your fingers in its mouth, it might nip you. But if you don't do that, it's just going to crawl on you and leave you alone. You know, I'm going to say something. If you want to get over your fear and you want to impress people, pet a bumblebee. Hmm. Bumblebees are big and fluffy. And when their face is buried inside a flower, they're not paying attention to anything else. So you can just sneak up on them and just pet them from behind. And they're very soft. And everyone will be impressed. Oh, you just pet the bee. But, you know, they're cute and they're soft and they're fluffy. And it's, and they're um, they're not particularly aggressive. So I always try to pet a bumblebee when I see them. They don't like it, but they don't do anything about it. How do you know they don't like it? <laughs> I just assume they don't like it. <laughs> that's, that's fair. And that's actually very considerate of you. So I'm glad you, you went there first correct me if i'm wrong there are about eight hundred thousand species of insects or more well, certainly more by now certainly I'm, I'm sure we've hit a million by now that we've discovered oh and those are only the ones that we've named and described we think the true number is probably closer to five million high estimates are 10 million wow and we're probably losing species faster than we're describing them at this point well which one of the ones that we still have is your favorite Oh, my favorite would probably be one of the ones that I did my PhD research on. It's called Extatosoma tiaratum. You can try to spell that based on my pronunciation. Extatosoma tiaratum. Very good. Okay. Or um, Maclay's specter. It's an Australian stick insect, Australian spiny stick insect. A lot of people keep them as pets because 
they're cool. Uh, they're very big. They look like little aliens. Well, they have little alien faces, um, but big bodies. Um, a nice thing about stick insects is when they are a little bit afraid, they dance side to side. It kind of looks like they, they're trying to imitate like a plant swaying in the breeze. Oh. Uh, and this will actually confuse... Um, other predators, they, they they think it's a plant swaying in the breeze, and they don't they don't eat them. So they're very cute. They go, they, it's like a little dance. Actually, that was also a meme, the stick bug dancing meme. Yeah. So how how what are the ethics of interacting with insects if you touch a bee and it doesn't like it, or you make a stick insect dance because you think it's cute but it's scared? How much pain can a bug really feel? How much stress affects uh, the health of a bug? It's a fair question. I mean, if it's a wild animal. Light, you know, nature is terrifying. They're they're going they're going to get eaten or attacked or killed. Uh, most likely, you know, all these birds and rodents and other creatures. Uh, so it's it's they're they're probably stressed out a lot. But if you want to ask about you know, you know, insect ethics of insect research or you know, do insects feel pain? Well, now we're getting into you know bigger questions in biology. But I'll give you the brief synopsis. We know that insects can sense damage to the body if you poke an insect with a sharp needle or something really hot, they react and we would call this pain. What we don't know is whether they suffer. Suffering is not the same thing as pain. You know, pain is, you know, you react to damage of the body. Suffering is this conscious, you know, desire to not experience that and the sense that, oh, my life would be so much better if I wasn't experiencing this particular sensation. It's just a question, you know, you could program a robot to detect when it is being damaged is that that robot is feeling pain. Is it suffering? No, it's a robot. It doesn't suffer. And there is a big question of, you know, how much are insects conscious and how much are they just little robots? And part of the problem is that nobody has a clear definition of consciousness. There is no universally agreed upon by biologists definition of what consciousness is. And until we have that, nobody can agree on whether insects are conscious or not. Or not. You know, some people say insects are conscious, but they're defining consciousness in a certain way that conveniently includes insects. As far as the law is concerned, you can do things with insects that you definitely cannot do with rats or monkeys or dogs, which makes it much easier to do research on them without all the paperwork, which I greatly appreciate. Nonetheless, good practice in science is to assume that your animals can feel pain and can suffer. So if I have to, and I do have to dissect insects, I do try to anesthetize them. Usually that means I put them in the fridge or the freezer. Uh, They're cold blooded, so that puts them to sleep. And then I We'll do whatever uh, dissections I need. So in science, you try to treat your organism as if it might feel pain and might suffer. But at least with insects, you don't have to do any paperwork. And that's just such a big headache uh, taken care of. Do I hesitate to kill mosquitoes? I don't hesitate in the slightest. What are some common misconceptions about insects or bugs that you would like to clear up for the world? I think too many people are afraid of them. And... They're not that dirty. You know, even cockroaches, they spend a lot of their day cleaning themselves. Probably, certainly more time in the bath than we'd spend. So insects are not really all that scary. Very few of them can hurt you. Uh, It depends where you live. You know, there are some caterpillars that you don't want to touch, including here in Taiwan. But the majority of things are going to be pretty harmless, and people are just absolutely terrified of them. Uh, Okay, bees, you know, if you're allergic, very serious problem. And mosquitoes, if they carry disease, very serious problem. But, you know, a grasshopper can't really hurt you. Um, most beetles, not all, most can't hurt you. I know I'm, I'm giving all these, you know, there's exceptions to every rule. But in general, insects aren't really a problem. And cockroaches, for example, as long as you're not, you know, putting them in your mouth or letting them crawl all over your food, you can pick them up and they're not going to do anything to you. They're pretty harmless. And they're doing an important service by eating all the garbage and filth that we leave on the ground. So I think just... It's annoying that people are so afraid of insects, and it's something that people learn when they're small. I think kids like bugs naturally, but if they see their parent being afraid, they're going to pick up on that fear, and I don't like that. So um, I would like people to be less afraid of things that have more than four legs. All right. Um, anything you want to plug or broadcast or, or anyone you want to thank? Just uh, say it on camera. <laughs> Ministry of Science, thank you very much. <laughs> thank my uh, my department for giving me the chance to come here. I've greatly enjoyed my time in Taiwan, not least because we are COVID free, so that has been an absolute pleasure. Um, but you know, I'm I'm glad they took a chance on me to be a professor here. I'm enjoying my time, and I have no plans to leave anytime soon. So I'm hoping I can continue to do some productive research and keep exploring new 
new avenues and new things about Taiwanese insects that nobody has ever found before. And certainly I look forward to sharing all my discoveries with the rest of the world once the International Entomology Convention can be held again. All right. Well, thank you for tuning into this week's episode of Taiwan Talk with Dr. Matan Shalomi. Thank you, everyone, for listening. See you next time.